Hi, everyone. This is your host, John Amarillo, and we are bringing to you a special election doubleheader with the next two interviews. They're interviews with Democratic candidate for Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul and Republican candidate for the same office, Erica Harold. But we're trying to do something different with these interviews. Rather than talk about political issues, which they've already talked about to exhaustion for anyone here in the state, we wanted to learn about who they are, how they grew up, and as importantly, why they're running for attorney general and how they view the role of a state attorney general in an increasingly partisan age. So these interviews are with Illinois attorney general candidates, yes, but it's really about a much broader conversation that we're having, or at least that I think we should be having all across the country. And with that, I hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CBA's At The Bar, a podcast where young and youngish lawyers discuss with our guests legal news, topics, stories, and whatever else strikes our fancy. I'm your host, John Amarillo of Taft, Statinius, and Hollister, and joining me today is Illinois State Senator and, more importantly for our purposes today, Democratic candidate for Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul. Welcome, Senator. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. So we have a lot of ground to cover, and I want to dive right into it. But before we do that, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you, who you are as a man, where you come from, what your background is. So let's start there. It's my understanding that, like me, you're the son of immigrants, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you tell I'm me about that. Son of uh, two Haitian immigrants who actually met in New York and uh, settled in Chicago in, in 1960. My uh, my mother was uh, working in a sweatshop, really, in, yeah. in in New York when she met my father, who was doing his residency. Medical and, doctor? Yeah, yeah, he was doing his residency with a focus on pathology at the time. And uh, he actually, when he finished, uh, he finished the top of his class, came out to Chicago with an interview at Loretta Hospital. And because it was 1960, they didn't expect the individual uh, who had finished at the top Too of bad. his residency <laughs> class to be. Oh, man you know, to be black. Um, How did that go? It didn't go well. <laughs> As a result, he borrowed some money from a um, friend and he set up a private practice on the South Side of focusing on internal medicine, just being a regular uh, community physician mm -hmm. uh, on staff at uh, community hospitals such as St. Bernard Hospital and the old Hyde Park Hospital. And sure. he was a type of uh, doc who uh, made house calls uh, yeah. with a little black bag with a stethoscope in there and a little medicine that he wow. would have in there. And a, he also had a little black pistol in there because he would make house calls at all times <laughs> of the night. Yeah, but he could fix anyone he shot. Just yeah. Right. And uh, so, yeah, he believed in health care yeah. as a human right. And he, he wouldn't reject patients. He'd often come home with a block of cheese, a fruit cake, wow. uh, or meal somebody had been prepared. So yeah, they raised me on the South Side in High Park. Mm -hmm. uh, Where'd you go to school? I uh, went to uh, elementary school, a uh, school that doesn't exist anymore. It's Harvard St. George, and okay. and then uh, high school at uh, the lab school, University of Chicago Lab School. Fantastic school. Uh, yeah, my uh, classmate and basketball teammate was uh, Arnie Duncan, who became the secretary Is that of right? education. I didn't know that. Yeah, we still play ball together. We, Quite fact, thank we, you, Bitter. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, uh, Justice uh, Stevens was a, a lab school right. student. Right, that time. I know. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I was raised there. Uh, Any in siblings? Parks. Two siblings, two older siblings, one who took the burden off of me of, uh, in terms of following dad's footsteps. So she became okay. a physician. <laughs> And my other uh, sister runs a, a not-for-profit in Brooklyn uh, working with undocumented immigrants, primarily of Haitian descent, but mm -hmm. also of other backgrounds. Uh, so she's really engaged on on that front. And um, me, I became a lawyer. Uh, some 25. <laughs> Black sheep of the family. <laughs> 25, yeah, yeah. There's enough jokes about lawyers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear them plenty. So... Um, how was your parents, ex your, both your parents were immigrants, not yes. just your father? Okay, so how was, how was their experience as immigrants? How did that inform your upbringing? Yeah, I think I had a perspective different than a lot of my friends, not right. just from being an immigrant, but specifically being a Haitian immigrant. Sure. You know, Haiti is known as um, 
you know, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Right. But it's also known as the country that just um, sort of got the freedom ball rolling in the Western Hemisphere. It's right. a country that uh, was born out of a slave revolt, uh, first black republic of the world. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, my parents, uh, uh, my father in particular, never would let me forget that origin. So I think that ingrained with me, uh, within me a, a spirit of that independence and the, that, that, and that justice and activism. Is that what made you want to go to law school? You know, I, I think it might have been a contributing factor. I think, quite honestly, as I was coming up in high school, uh, I had no idea what uh, what precisely sure. I wanted to do. And, and as I started in, in college, you know, I started out at an engineering school. I started out at IIT because I was strong in math and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And everybody told me- strong in math, that's okay, <laughs> wow, I've met one. Yeah, but everybody told me that, you know, well, you should study uh, engineering. And uh, I started at, at IIT and discovered that that wasn't the pathway I wanted to take. And so I actually transferred to, the, to DePaul University. Mm -hmm. I took a political science class. It was the first college course that I enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, How far into college were you when you started enjoying that, it? Uh, that was probably junior year. Okay. <laughs> I, let, let's, not, let's be clear. I enjoyed college. Yeah, well, <laughs> that right. Was a, that was the first the classroom class, part, anyway. yeah. class uh, that I enjoyed. And uh, so I started taking more political science classes with uh, some of them being pre-law courses that were taught in a Socratic method. And so yeah. I, I, I got a little taste of what it would be like to be in law school. And, you know, a couple of years out of college, I... I uh, decided to go apply. I had worked a couple of years as a quality auditor for a company that bought packaging for the McDonald's Corporation. That sounds fun. It was actually fun because I was yeah. able to travel the country and oh, visit okay. a lot of small towns and right. some small towns that were fortunately around some big towns. So yeah. uh, I was really able to see America. You sure. know, I traveled like about 80% of the times at oh, wow. time and, uh, and I, I got to see... Um, all regions of the country. So did you uh, come back to Chicago for law school? Yeah, I stayed in Chicago. I, uh, we were based in, in okay. Westmont at the time, but uh, did maybe 80% 80, 80 traveling. And I came back to uh, law school at Chicago Kent. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do after law school? I started my career as a uh, prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, right. starting in, in the Criminal Appeals Division. I went in there kind of begging, trying to get on the civil side of the office. Yeah. And after finishing my uh, stint in criminal appeals, I was granted an opportunity to go to the civil side, okay. but they put me in industrial claims where I was doing uh, <laughs> workers' compensation defense for about a year and a half. Okay. Then I begged my way back onto the criminal, <laughs> criminal side uh, where I was put in the juvenile court. And soon there, uh, maybe a couple of years later, I discovered that my fastest way to 26th Street was to go into uh, a small private practice. So I was in a boutique practice. We were located on a storefront in Evanston. Is that right? Uh, my partner was... Uh, Hanging a shingle, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was be the pretty much two, three lawyer office. Uh, uh, Lionel Jean-Baptiste, who's now on the bench, was my uh, partner. We, we shared being of uh, Haitian descent. And so and being located in Evanston, we had a natural client base there. And mm -hmm. so did a little bit of everything. I call it a, a bit of a potpourri practice. Whatever somebody came in the door needing, we were prepared to uh, I've always do. admired uh, solos who can do that. It doesn't seem easy, especially in this era of specialization amongst yeah. lawyers, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing that that type of practice uh, prepared me for was thinking on my feet. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I did a lot of uh, driving around to the various branch courts, you know, uh, often doing a lot of the misdemeanor trials that, you yeah. know, didn't uh, involve the level of uh, preparation that uh, some of the, when we do felony trials that we do, so you, you have to really think on your feet because right. you, you do trials the same day that you're... Yeah, it's the wild, wild west, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, uh, show up and try it. Yeah, and you'd have calls uh, at three different courthouses at the same time, so <laughs> you'd, you'd be practicing under the back seat of your car. Right. Uh, I learned a lot from that, though. You know, what did you learn? I, I, you know, I learned uh, to engage with all sorts of individuals, your clients. Uh, you don't always uh, pick your clients. Your clients pick you. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you learn that uh, while a case may seem like a small case when juxtaposed against you know, bigger, 
more high profile case for that particular client. Um, it means everything. It means everything. And yeah. So you had to learn to appreciate that, particularly when you had a variety of clients and a variety of levels sure. of, of, of cases that you were dealing with. And how long did you do that for? I did that for four years. And I went back in-house with the city colleges of Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, doing primarily employment and uh, traditional labor. I negotiated with uh, 13 different collective bargaining units on behalf of the city colleges. I, I defended employment practices, litigation cases in federal court, defended some tort cases. In, 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 so still a little in, bit of everything. Yeah, and did some workers' comp, as well as supervising some outside counsel as well. Sure. Um, so we did both, you know, hands-on trying of cases as well as uh, uh, supervising outside counsel on cases. What lessons would you say you took from that experience? Well, the uniqueness of the client, you know, that uh, the chancellor, the then chancellor, you used to always say, we're all educators. Mm. Um, and so as a lawyer, you're a student of the law and you, you observe the law and what an important thing with every client that you get is learning uh, the client, if the client is in a business, learning that client's business. If, right. it, if it's a individual, learning what you know, that individual's goals are. Mm -hmm. So in the case of representing a community college system that was a system designed to provide access to a lot of uh, non-traditional uh, right. higher education students. It was a second chance for many of them. It was important for the chancellor to let us know that, you know, it wasn't for us just simply about defending an employment discrimination case or engaging in uh, negotiations with the collective bargaining units about uh, steps and disciplinary processes and, and uh, working conditions. Everything was to be centered around the notion of delivering educational services. So you ha we'd have to think from that sort of paradigm sure. as we were uh, representing. Noble mission. So does that take us up to 2004 then? When you were yeah, I was. So in 2004, you were um, appointed to fill the seat in the Illinois State Senate that was left vacant by then newly U.S. Senator Barack Obama. So kind of some big shoes to fill there. How how Indeed. how is that? How did Indeed. that go? Well, you know, you just get first a phone off, call, the, you, you need some backdrop on okay. that. Right. Um, you know, I have to acknowledge that I'm a three-time loser. <laughs> what I mean by that is I I ran for office three times unsuccessfully. I ran twice for alderman against Tony Pretwinkle. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Once in so. 1995 and one in 1999. I, so I, you picked the easy fight. <laughs> well, I was, you know, I, was, I, I came out of law school in 93. The campaign for Alderman started in 94. I just wanted to engage yeah. in public service, and I didn't want to be a carpet bagger. I grew up in Hyde Park, so I just ran uh, from where I lived. Got to love the spirit. Um, and I uh, got trounced. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but one of the things that did happen from that race is I, I got a lot of young professionals to be engaged in caring about a political race and sure. paying attention to politics. And so I think that was one of the wins I took away from that. In 96, I actually ran against um, former state senator, and he's also a former state representative, Bobby Malaro, uh, for state senate. And, um, you know, that was the same year, 96. Uh, the district lines were different. That was the same year that Barack Obama ran for the first time for a state oh, senate. Okay. Uh, his district at that time was directly across the street from mine. I didn't oh. move, but yeah. the, uh, at, at redistricting time, the, the lines moved. And so his first time running for state senate was my second time running for office and was my first time running for state senate. Did you give him some pointers? <laughs> Let me tell you how it's done. He was a little bit more of a poised candidate at the time than, <laughs> I, than I was, notwithstanding the fact that I had uh, just run the previous year for, for Alderman. So that's how you formed your connections in the political uh, sphere. Yeah. Well, so as it happened, when you vacate a seat, as Barack Obama did in 2004, when he won the race for the U.S. Senate, the committeemen within the district vote on a weighted vote basis mm -hmm. to replace the incumbent, the previous office holder. In my case, the 13th district was heavily weighted in the 4th and 5th wards. Uh, the 4th ward 
at the time, the alderman there was Tony Prettwinkle, and yeah. she was also the committee woman there. Yeah. And in the fifth ward, it was Leslie Harrison. Uh, while the district touched maybe 10 or 11 wards, and between the two of them, they had 55% of the weighted vote. Okay. <laughs> it just so happens that I had been, after I lost to Tony the second time, I started volunteering for her organization. I was running a volunteer legal clinic once a month out of her office. It expanded into the fifth ward, where I was doing it also in the fifth ward for Leslie Harrison, who I actually went to high school with. Mm. And um, I was just engaging in volunteerism. I had no idea that Barack Obama was going to be running Barack for Obama. U.S. Senate. And yeah. certainly I thought, I wouldn't have thought that if he would run for U.S. Senate, that he would have won. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, if you think about it at the outset of when he was running, both Tony and Leslie spoke to me about the possibility of me running in a sub circuit race. Oh, is that right? And that's, this was in 2003 leading up into the 2004 okay. primary. At the time in 2003, my father had been given uh, months to live. He was a victim of prostate uh, cancer. Um, so I decided for myself that I was not going to be a candidate uh, for anything during that primary. Um, and so I deferred to Ed Washington, who... Uh, uh, ended up running for that sub-circuit seat and, and winning that sub-circuit seat. But it worked seat. out for you in the end? Yes, it did. I, but I remember a conversation I had with Les, Leslie Harrison about that. I kind of kept my cards close to my chest yeah. and where she said, uh, well, you know, um, as she, Ed and I spoke, Kwame um, Brock is running for U.S. Senate and – it's a possibility he might win, in, in which case that seems something like uh, more, more like something you would have a passion for. I said, come on, Leslie. There's no way Barack is going to win this U.S. Senate race. <laughs> it was a crazy election. Dan Hines is, in, yeah. is this politically connected yeah. family. and uh, There was like the, the, Jim Ryan, well, right, yeah, the yeah, sex he was scandal. In, yeah, and, and you had uh, Keys, Blair Hull who pledged to spend $50 million, which, you know, maybe compared to this year's gubernatorial yeah, races, not right? yeah. <laughs> but for back then was a lot of money. So it was hard to imagine that a guy by the name of Barack Obama was going to win a statewide race for U.S. Senate. Sure, um, but sure enough, that March he won, and I I immediately contacted Tony and Leslie, and I said I'm interested. Yeah. and uh, they had me demonstrate my capacity to get people behind me and mm -hmm. demonstrate that I would be a viable candidate if challenged after appointment and they saw fit to appoint me. And so you've been there for 14 years now? Is that yeah. right? been there for 14 years. Uh, I remember my first day there, Barack was there and he gave yeah. me some very valuable advice. He was there to say goodbye to, to some colleagues. And uh, I said, Barack, you know, this is my first time in, in the state capitol. Could you give me some advice <laughs> here? He says, well, I've got a plane to catch. I'm going to eat lunch in my office. Why don't you follow me in there, and we can talk while I eat lunch. Wow. I said, well, isn't that my office now? And uh, <laughs> he didn't laugh, but uh, <laughs> he did uh, allow me to come in the office, and, yeah. and he shared with me. He said, you know, Kwame, you know some people from Chicago. It's the easiest for th thing for you to just gravitate to those people. My advice to you is get to know people from other parts of the state and on the other side of the aisle. Get to know them as friends. Mm. Uh, discover what your commonalities are. And more importantly, learn about your differences in a way that doesn't divide you. It's a poignant uh, message these days. Yeah, and he says, have conversations beyond the point of when you would be offended. Mm. You'll learn more that way, um, and you'll bring along people more uh, that way. That piece of wisdom sounds like a great place for us to take a quick break. Yeah. We'll be right back. This episode of At the Bar brought to you by One Legal, America's top rated court filing solution. One Legal's simple workflows and local support make it easy to file in large and complex courts like Cook, Marion, and LA counties. Chicago bar members get up to 15% off. Learn more at onelegal.com backslash CBA. <laughs> And we're back. 
So, Senator, you get down to Springfield. You've got some big shoes to fill, although they weren't quite as big as they would end up being just yet. Mm-hmm. What did you do with your time in Springfield, or what have you done with your time in Springfield? Well, you know, I've tried to um, run towards difficult issues. I've come to be known as uh, the guy that uh, handles what is often characterized as middle of the highway legislation. It's middle of the highway because you get hit by traffic going both directions. Sure. That uh, Everybody's a little bit disappointed with the outcome and everybody's a little bit happy with the outcome. That's how you know you did a good job, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, you know, these are things like negotiating workers' compensation reform, mm-hmm. um, working on gun policy. You know, when we were mandated to pass a concealed carry law, Senate President Cullerton turned towards me to negotiate um, that bill, uh, criminal justice reform packages. Um, I actually had a conversation with Bruce Rauner seven days after he was elected, and I suggested to him that a place where he could gain some by partisan support and an accomplishment is criminal justice reform that mm-hmm. folks like Newt Gingrich and um, Grover Norquist and the Koch brothers had even endorsed right. uh, criminal justice reform. And so uh, he and I actually penned an op-ed together soon after he became governor and he signed an executive order creating a criminal justice reform commission on which I served along with Roger Heaton, a man who I tremendously respect, a former U.S. attorney for the Central District who served as the uh, chair of the commission. Mm. He's now, Roger's now his chief of staff. Roger and I, along with other professionals, worked on a package of recommendations to the General Assembly, some of which we put into legislation in which I, which I carried. What did those include? It included um, certain uh, more leeway on uh, mandatory supervised release so we don't send people back into prison just for technical violations right. when, when it it's no, there's no really need to uh, do that. Uh, more discretion in terms of uh, some nonviolent uh, offenses, uh, reduction in truth in sentencing for certain uh, offenses. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the other hand, it also included a more targeting of stiff penalties on a certain population uh, of repeat gun offenders. Mm. Uh, so we had a balance uh, within the legislation. There are probably some components that I'm, uh, of it that I'm forgetting at the, sure. at the moment. You were a big um, motivating force behind the abolition of the death penalty, if I understand yeah, correctly, right? Yeah, I was the Senate sponsor of the legislation. That was a real, uh, that was a, probably one of the most moving moments for me mm. in the legislature. I, I remember Randy Steidel, who had sat on uh, death row for 17 years, testifying in in the committee as uh, we had people weighing in on both sides of the issue. And and um, there were those who advocated that we had implemented a lot of reforms and that my predecessor had advanced videotape interrogation. And um, we had made sure that in capital cases, everybody received adequate counsel, that with these reforms that, you know, we were okay with continuing <laughs> with the death penalty. Right. But I made the point that, um, you know, in three different counties, you had three different individuals that were accused and charged with killing their loved ones, two people charged for killing their daughters, one charged with killing their mother who had implicated themselves on, on videotape for crimes they did not commit. Wow. That showed the fallacy of uh, a criminal justice system that's run by human beings who are right. fallible. You can't take back an execution. That's right, and Randy Steidel testified to just that he said, you know, you can release an individual from prison, but you cannot release them from the grave, um, and that was just That's such a, a powerful moving, line. <laughs> powerful line. Yeah, yeah. And I, I repeated it in my closing, as I argued for the abolition on the Senate floor. One of the interesting things that came back to Barack Obama's initial advice was that as we were taking a roll call in the Senate, I only had 27 Democrat votes for the abolition of the death penalty. And just so our audience knows, how big is the Illinois Senate? There are 59 members, so you need okay. 30 votes to So to just pass a little shy. We ended up with 32 votes. And, you know, oftentimes when you have bills that fall primarily on partisan lines where there may be some crossover, the crossover is usually from individuals who are more moderate mm. Republicans. Some of the votes were not from Republican senators who would be characterized as moderate Republicans. Is that right? 
Yep. What brought them over? I think I remember approaching uh, Senator Dan Duffy, and I said, yeah, I noticed he had signed on as a uh, sponsor of the bill, and Dan is known as more of a conservative uh, right. yeah. <laughs> Democrat. And Dan said, you know, Kwame, sometimes what's right is right, and uh, I know what I signed on to. Because uh, the wow. bill started out as a bill that, when I initially passed it out to the House, that had nothing to do with the death penalty. It was a bill that had to do with probation services. And when we felt like we were getting momentum in the House to get votes in the House, we used that as a vehicle bill to put the abolition of the death penalty on there. You know, there were others like uh, Senator Tom Johnson, who I frequently would cross the aisle to speak to, uh, who serves on the Prisoner Review Board now as a after retirement from the legislature. And, and Tom and I was, used to always have conversations. And Tom was one who said, you know, I don't think that execution is necessarily a bad penalty for one's bad acts. Mm-hmm. But he was clear that he understood that we were fallible and we had gotten it wrong far too many times. And his conscience couldn't allow him to continue with the death penalty, given that, you know, we were second only to the state of Florida in a number of uh, men we sent to death no, row for really? crimes they had not commit. Oh, wow. Committed. I just, I would have assumed uh, Texas was right up there. Well, so the challenge <laughs> with Texas is Texas has swift justice. And, you right. know, once you execute somebody, um, it's, it's Case little, closed. Yep. Yeah. So speaking of justice and legal issues, you're running for Illinois Attorney General. Uh, you are Lisa Madigan, I should say, has been the Attorney General of Illinois for, I'm failing to remember how long. Going on but, 16 years. So, okay, now. so my entire adult life, pretty much. <laughs> One of the things that she has really stepped up in the past year, year and a half, is filing lawsuits against the federal government. Yeah. She's filed about 30, if I remember correctly, uh, everything from the travel ban to deportation of DACA recipients, family separation at the border, uh, protection of ACA coverage, the infamous 2020 census question regarding citizenship, yep. net neutrality. And as I was looking at this, it you know these are all obviously hot button political issues, but at their core, they're also legal issues. And that brings it to mind what the role of an attorney general is. And it's, I'd love to get your opinion on it's what, really what evolved, is that. It's really evolved, right? Yeah. You know, I have to admit, Lisa introduced me most recently at a, a Democrat Attorney General's Association conference that was held in, policy conference that was held in Chicago as we both did the welcome for it. And she said, well, Kwame's had his eye on my job for some time. And, <laughs> and she wasn't lying when she said that because <laughs> I thought she was going to be running for governor uh, four years ago. And so Everyone five years did. Yeah. yeah, so five years ago, I started planning on running for Attorney General. Yeah. The attorney general's office that I was going to run for uh, four years ago is, is, is dramatically different from the attorney general's right. office that I'm running for today because I really believe that who we elect as attorney general, not only in the state of Illinois, but throughout the country, matters more than it has at any time in American history. Why? Well, you know, it used to be, and Sherilyn Eiffel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, who spoke in Chicago recently at the ABA I was uh, there dinner. at the dinner. If yeah. you remember, oh, she, 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 one of the things she said, we used to rely on the U.S. Attorney's Office to come into the right. uh, states and defend the rights of people, on some, yeah. oftentimes against the overreach of the state government or right. the local government. Katzenbach and, yeah, and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, uh, desegregation schools, right. voting rights, and, you know, um, cops. And uh, now... The shoes on the other foot. It is uh, state attorneys general uh, individually sometimes, like Lisa Madigan with the consent decree stepping up when Jeff Sessions stepped away from what Loretta Lynch mm-hmm. uh, initiated to the things that uh, they're doing collectively. You mentioned travel ban that started with Bob Ferguson, uh, attorney general in Washington, who right. uh, I've, I've come to know. Uh, you've got um, keeping uh, kids together with their Parents, you know, mm-hmm. the separation of kids from their parents. You know, you've got stopping the the ridiculous notion of publishing uh, blueprints for undetectable three three D guns that uh, yeah. the Trump administration was going to allow to have until state attorneys general stepped in. And one that's near and dear to me, um, not that all the other ones right. are, um, is uh, protection of access to health care through uh, a couple of different lawsuits. You know, first there was one that 
where uh, state attorneys general stepped up when the federal government was going to take away subsidies for the Affordable Care Act. Mm-hmm. And, and most recently, there's litigation uh, in the Texas District Court where Republican attorney generals have sued to, to try to take away protection for uh, uh, pre-existing conditions. And Jeff Sessions and Donald Trump have stepped away from defending it, and it is a Democrat a state attorneys general who have collectively, including Lisa Madigan, stepped forth to defend the Affordable Care Act. I say it's personal because, um, you know, one, I mentioned my dad is right. was a community physician, and he believed in health care as a human right. Two, I lost him to prostate cancer, which uh, struck me three years ago, and it was my access to health care that allowed me to screen after I answered that question of family history mm. at, at a visit to the, my physician's office, and that led to us, because prostate cancer took not only my dad, it took my both of my grandfathers and struck oh, uncles wow. on both sides, so I had a strong family history. That is what the Affordable Care Act tries to focus on. Preventive medicine. Preventive medicine. Right. Getting all people to have access to early detection based on family history, based on annual screenings, Mm -hmm. I embraced it. And so three years ago when my day came and I got a positive uh, biopsy result, one of the things I knew is I had screened religiously. And so I was probably the beneficiary of early detection. And I also knew with that access to healthcare, I could shop for the best surgeon in the area. I found the guy who had performed the most Da Vinci robotic uh, prostatectomies in the region, and uh, <laughs> I won't ask about the details. <laughs> but uh, it's actually kind of cool. You're, you're, you're Wait, <laughs> come on, let's focus. Let's focus. Law. But, uh, but you know, and I've got a great prognosis. You know, I, I, I believe that more than likely I've got all the cancer out of my body, and I can sit ready today to fight for that same access for other people that should have that same access to that early detection that I did. So there's been this shift, right? But when I usually think of the role of state's attorney general, I think of as the chief legal officer of the state in Illinois, and as it is in most states, Mm -hmm. and that usually entails defending the state against lawsuits. But as you um, were discussing a few minutes ago, that has really shifted, and a lot of Democratic state's attorney generals have gone on the offensive to proactively yeah. defend certain rights and go after certain issues against the federal government. My question with that is, how do you balance it, those two roles? Because one seems you're supposed to be you know, kind of this apolitical mm-hmm. actor, right? A lawyer's lawyer. Right. And the other part of it is perhaps necessarily involved in the daily rough and tumble of politics. What's, what's the right balance to your mind? Yeah. Well, I bring to being a lawyer, the reason I became a lawyer uh, is to be an advocate, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if you think fundamentally what you do, you know, even being respectful to the rule of law, you're in there to utilize it to advocate for the interest of your client. Right. If you think of the caption and a lot of the cases involving the state, it is not the state of Illinois, it's the people of the state of Illinois. So if you think of that in the context of some of the federal action that has taken place, much of it impacts people within the state of Illinois. And it's upon that principle that a state attorneys general can have standing in a case right. to u- reunify kids with their parents because it would impact people who were within sure. the state of Illinois. I imagine as a as a father, that issue probably hit pretty close to home, right? It, as a father and as and as a child of immigrants, right? Um, and you know, and, and what people don't know because they figure it's the border and it's, it's probably mostly people from Central American and Mexico. There's a fair m- number of Haitians mm. involved in that as well because after the Olympics and the World Cup, you know, many Haitians went to Brazil to work in oh, Haiti, okay. and they traveled through. South America and Central America to get to the border. So, sure. so my sister was all, uh, as an advocate for undocumented uh, immigrants w- had been already involved at the border. Yeah. Um, so I was aware of that, and so it kind of informed my posture as I spoke publicly about this. 
But on a lot of fronts, it, yes, it is a balancing act because you also just have to take on the mundane uh, task of being the managing partner of the law firm that represents the state, state of Illinois. Right. And so some of the things that, you know, I, I sp as I spoke to you earlier that I have practice history on, you know, doing workers' compensation defense, uh, negotiating labor contracts, uh, defending employment uh, litigation. Might come uh, in handy. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I've got that experience to an extent that, um, you know, my opponents in the race don't. You yeah. Know. So set aside our policy differences. Just opponents. Just, Wait, you said opponent. Yeah, I've got a oh, libertarian. Bubba. Bubba. Right. Well, I can't forget I Bubba. Forgot. DuCoin, Illinois. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Bubba's my girlfriend's nice actually from DuCoin. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I went down there for the fair. Yeah, yeah little, right. That's time. about, <laughs> yes. But they have, don't say it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, Bubba's actually a nice guy, but he's, you know, he's a lawyer of two years. Right. My other opponent is a lawyer of 11 years. And mm -hmm. within that 11 years, she's been with three different law firms, run for Congress twice, and attorney general now. So I don't know how much practicing of law you mm -hmm. get to do. I know she's tried one case in her, that her career. Years. One yeah. case? Uh, you know, a bench trial. I've done jury trials, both the federal court, state court. I've done a bunch of bench trials. I've uh, tried cases before administrative uh, tribunals. I've argued cases on appeal. Mm -hmm. I've negotiated contracts. You know, I've got a broad practice experience. So in terms of having the capacity to do the balancing that you suggest has to be done, I've got a practice history to combine with my policymaking history of my 14 years in the legislature that allows me to do that balancing act. So you're, now that you've mentioned um, your opponent, Erica Harold, mm -hmm. the Republican candidate, that brings to mind something that I heard um, our governor, Bruce Rauner, say not too long ago, which was that if she won, he would hope that she would open up a corruption investigation into the Speaker of the Illinois House, Mike Madigan. And that that caught my ear not so much because of the politics of it, which yeah. I don't think we need to get into, but because of what we were just discussing about the role of the attorney general, yeah. because that sounded, and yeah, I don't believe, at least that I've heard, Miss Harold has accepted that mission from him. Yeah. Um, but it raised the specter of what we're seeing from you know certain sectors in Washington now, the idea of like political prosecutions, and that alarmed me. It it, it alarmed me as well, and and you know I I can tell you that if it was somebody who had been a major donor to me who had made that comment, I would immediately say. That is, a, and very publicly say, it, that is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very dangerous thing to say that, you know, we want to prop this person up to go after a political enemy. Right. Uh, using the Attorney General's office using as a attorney collateral general. political. The act. Attorney General's office should be a nonpartisan office, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of your functioning within the office. It, it ought not be one used for partisan purposes. Um, I believe there was a Pennsylvania attorney general who was indicted for oh, being right. political yeah. uh, with regards to the powers of the attorney general's office. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard of uh, political prosecutions that uh, may or may not have taken place with regards to our current U.S. attorney general when he was at a more local level. <laughs> yep. um, just as one has to have faith in law enforcement and faith in the bench and the faith in the jury system, one has to really have faith in the attorney general's office and a, and a prosecutor's a local prosecutor's office to um, be one to look at evidence and the law and make determinations as to whether to pursue prosecutions based on where evidence leads, not where one's politics leads. And with that very ethical note, I think we'll take our second break. Thank you. This episode of At the Bar brought to you by One Legal, America's top rated court filing solution. One Legal's simple workflows and local support make it easy to file in large and complex courts like Cook, Marion, and LA counties. Chicago bar members get up to 15% off. Learn more at onelegal.com backslash CBA. <laughs> Thank you.
And we're back. Senator, I want to play a game with you that we play with all of our guests. It's called Stranger Than Legal Fiction. The rules are really straightforward. I've researched some Arcania from Illinois law, found a law that is real, but weird, you know, obscure, shouldn't still be on the books, but is. And then I've just made another one up completely. And uh, your task today is to see if you can distinguish strange legal fact from fiction. Are you ready to play? Let's go. All right. Option number one, in Decatur, Illinois, it is illegal to drive a car without a steering wheel. All right. Option number two, in Champaign, Illinois, it is illegal to serve a carbonated alcoholic beverage after 11 p.m. What do you think? you got to believe that uh, option number one is not a law. Why? How do you drive a... Well, it's a good question. A car without a steering wheel. Yeah. I guess technology is evolving that you can, but... Uh, so option number one's a fake one? Yeah, I think so. Final answer? Yeah. Okay, option number one is the real one. Can you believe it? I didn't have a chance to do all the research to find out why, but Steve and I, our sound guy, were talking about this before, and I wonder if it doesn't come from that time when, you know, when you see like old-timey movies and they're driving horseless carriages, right? And they've got the levers oh, and yeah. the, I, I, I don't know. But that's the real one, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, when you think of it as in, in the context of it being arcane, you know, it seems that it wouldn't be likely responsive to new technology, right? Right, <laughs> suddenly relevant again, yeah. right? Yeah. I think that's all the time we're going to have today. I want to thank our guest, Illinois State Senator Kwame Raoul, for joining me today in what has been a truly fascinating discussion. Um, good luck, sir. Thank you. I also want to thank everyone here at the CBA who makes this machine run, including most especially our sound guy, Steve Wyrick. This is his last episode today, Steve. I want to thank you for all the work you've done this first season of At The Bar. It's been fantastic. Also, our executive producer, Jen Byrne. Remember, you can follow us and send us comments, questions, episode ideas, or just troll us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at CBA at the Bar, all one word. Please also rate us and leave us your feedback on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you download your podcast. It helps us get the word out. Until next time, for everyone here at the CBA, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon at the Bar. <laughs>